Imagine you have a bunch of bombs with light detectors which trigger an explosion when even a single photon reaches them. Some of them, however, have faulty detectors which fail to cause an explosion when light is shined on them. Since you don't know which is which, you would like to find out for safety reasons, of course. The classical approach to do this would be to just put each of them under a lamp and see what happens. If they explode, they are alive, if not, they are dead. Unfortunately, at the end of this process, no matter the outcome, you wouldn't be left with a working bomb. Intuitively, it seems that there is no way to test whether a bomb works or not without interacting with it, which ultimately renders the whole testing procedure useless. Fortunately and frustratingly, nature is anything but intuitive on its most fundamental level. As a consequence, it turns out that, through the beautiful quirks of quantum physics, a way can be devised through which to establish at least in some cases which bombs are live without exploding them. One way to do that is what we call ELISA Friedman bomb test. Before introducing that, you need to understand how Maxander interferometer works. To achieve the setup for the interferometer, you will need a couple of components. The light source, two mirrors M1 and M2, detector A and B, as well as two beam splitters BS1 and BS2. And even beam splitters causes a quarter phase shift of light when the beam is being reflected. So now here is the structure of the interferometer. When the light shines on BS1, this will redirect light into two paths. The light in the upper path will get shifted a quarter of a wavelength, whereas there is no phase change of the light traveling through the lower path. Let's focus on upper path. The light goes to mirror 1 and is reflected and then reaching to BS2. Then the light is split towards detector A and B. Another quarter of phase shift is formed A. Now, let's take a look at detectors. For detector A, there is a total lambda over 2 phase change and there is a total lambda over 4 phase change on detector B. Okay, now let's focus on the lower path. The light goes to mirror 2 and is reflected to BS2. Then it reaches the BS2 at upper right, being split and towards detector A and B. Let's see detector A. There is no phase change. And for detector B, there is a total lambda over 4 phase changes. So we got half of lambda phase difference between the light on upper and lower path. Therefore, destructive interference happens. In other words, no light will reach detector A. And there is no phase difference in B because the phase shift of the upper and lower paths are the same, which means constructive interference happens. And so the whole intensity of the light will be detected in B. What happens if we turn down the power of the light source? Well, the light source will finally become a photon. But photon can behave like a wave, meaning it can interference with itself. Therefore, same result happens on photon case. In other words, detector B will always detect the whole intensity of the photon. But what happens when you block one of the paths? If none of the paths are blocked, the light or the photon can never reach detector A. So let's see how the probabilities change when we block the bottom path of the interferometer with a wooden block, let's say. For the purpose of quantum mechanics, the block of wood is an observer, and since nature doesn't like observers, when one is present in the Mach sender interferometer, the photon stops behaving like a wave. As such, the interference pattern seen before breaks, and at each beam splitter, the photon has a 50-50 chance of being transmitted or being reflected. Hence, there is a 50% chance of the photon being transmitted and absorbed by the block. There is also a 50% chance of the photon being reflected and taking the upper path. However, when reaching the second beam splitter, there is a 50% equal chance that the particle will take either path, which equates to an overall of 25% of reaching either one of the two detectors. With this knowledge, let's now test if there is a way to verify that a bomb is working without exploding it. Let's now add a defective bomb, a dot, into your interferometer. If the bomb is effective, the detector doesn't work and lets the photon go through. This works exactly like the case where no bomb, and thus no detector, was present in the system. So, as seen before, the probabilities of the possible outcomes are 0% that the photon reaches detector A, 100% that the photon will reach detector B, and 0% of the bomb exploding. But what if the bomb is live? How will the probabilities change then? Since the detector on the bomb works, this case is analogous to the case of having a block of wood blocking the path. Consequently, the probabilities are There is a 50% chance of the bomb exploding. 
there is a 25% chance of the photon detector A and the bomb not exploding and a 25% chance of the photon reaching detector B and the bomb still not exploding. So if the bomb doesn't work, the photon can never reach detector A and all the photons are being detected in B. So the fact that some photons can reach A implies that the bomb didn't explode and it's working. This thought experiment was initially conceived in 1993 by Avshalom Elitzer and Lev Weidmann, and an equivalent experiment was actually achieved in 1994, proving interaction-free measurements possible. The authors of the experiment point out how the ability to detect information on the functionality of the bomb without interacting with it appears to be a paradox. This, they say, is based on the assumption that there is only one real result. But according to the many worlds interpretation, an interpretation of quantum mechanics, each possible state of the particle's superposition is real. Therefore, the particle does actually interact with the bomb and it does explode, just not in our world.